I have the opportunity to talk about renal cell tumors, which is one of my favorite topics. Um, feel free to you'll reach out afterwards if you have any questions or anything like that. And of course, um, live, I'll be happy to answer any questions here. Um, so first, let's just start off with sort of an introduction about renal cell tumors. We'll kind of go through in a pattern-based approach by some of the more common patterns, uh, clear cell, papillary, and eosinophilic, and then talk about some other tumors. What's important about renal tumor pathology? Well, I think nowadays we might be asked to do more with less. That is, we might be asked to diagnose renal mass biopsies more regularly or perhaps biopsies from metastatic sites of renal cancer. And it may be tricky with just a very small visualization of the tumor. Um, there is a trend toward less aggressive management of renal tumors. So if you have a very small renal mass, there may be consideration for surveillance. And so the diagnosis that we make in a biopsy could be relevant for, for surveillance. Uh, and then there's increasing recognition that renal cell cancer is more than one disease, and uh, trying to divide them into clear cell or non-clear cell types may be important for, for management purposes, especially with, when you have metastatic renal cancer. Uh, clinicians will, would like to know, ideally, if we have a clear cell or non-clear cell tumor. Um, so here's just an example of what, you might, what, what might happen based on a renal mass biopsy. So uh, say a renal mass biopsy is performed, this is from a, a publication in the Journal of Urology um, several years ago. If the histology is benign, like for example angiomyolipoma, then the, nothing further needs to be done. Uh, but if you have a very low risk tumor, like a chromophobe renal cell carcinoma or a low grade papillary renal cell carcinoma, um, this algorithm suggests that active surveillance would be reasonable. Um, as you have kind of intermediate risk tumors like a clear cell of grade one to two or a higher grade papillary tumor, uh, the algorithm kind of figures that depending on tumor size, if you have a very small size, that may be amenable to active surveillance. But as um, the size is larger, that may be a candidate for surgery. And then very high risk tumors are kind of automatically a candidate for surgery, such as tumors that are grade three or urothelial carcinomas or comatoid or unclassified renal cell carcinomas. So just an example of what might happen based on renal mass biopsy. Uh, the way I kind of approach it is that if a renal mass biopsy is being done, it probably means that the clinicians are thinking of doing something different other than the routine resection of the renal mass. And so I should think about the sort of the risk of the tumor and try to do a uh, my best to classify it into a specific box, uh, whether it's a high or low risk tumor. So if you have you know, a patient that perhaps is elderly with multiple comorbidities, that may be uh, a, uh, an indication for surveillance. So a biopsy might be done considering that surveillance would be um, undertaken for a patient who has you know, perhaps not a, an extreme. We're gonna do some uh, sneaky cancers in gastric biopsies. Everyone's favorite topic, puts hair on your chest. I have no conflicts to report, and so today in uh, this discussion, we're going to focus on like two broad categories, benign mimics of gastric cancer and biopsy samples, talking about macrophages and epithelial mimics, and then carcinomas that simulate benign conditions, both diffuse type and tubular type carcinomas. So let's start off with benign mimics of carcinoma. The, big situ the major situation which you're gonna come up against uh, benign repair type changes that simulate neoplasia are in the context of chemical gastropathy with ulcers. What happens is you'll, and there are a lot of different scenarios, the epithelial cell atypia related to repair, gastric xanthomas or macrophage responses to ruptured epithelial cells, uh, sloughed mucous neck cells that simulate signet ring cell carcinoma, tissue processing artifacts, and mucosal ischemia. So you'll remember from a few days ago, chemical gastropathy, we see a diffuse alteration in the epithelial cell uh, morphology and architecture without much inflammation to explain those changes. So the pits are elongated and they're lined by cells that are cytoplasmically depleted uh, with a, a nuclear enlargement and scattered mitotic activity. Most of the time, what you can appreciate is that there's maturation of this epithelial cell atypia as you move to the surface of the, of the mucosa. You can get into trouble when there are erosions in areas of extreme uh, uh, repair because um, that induces even more cytologic abnormalities, as you can see here. A few clues that you're dealing with a benign process uh, you see superficial fragments that do show 
uh, 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 maturation and the overall proliferation uh, respects the boundaries within the mucosa. So you'll see that there is a lobular architecture overall with preserved bundles of smooth muscle cells and vessels uh, permeating the mucosa. Higher power, you can see some of that cytologic atypia over here. In general, I would say don't make a diagnosis of low-grade dysplasia or uh, and be very careful about a carcinoma diagnosis in the setting of chemical gastropathy with an erosion. My colleague Liz Montgomery some time ago published a paper uh, talking about repair type atypia in Barrett esophagus and in the gastric mucosa and described what she calls the four lines of maturation in benign epithelium and I thought, or non-neoplastic epithelium. And I think it's a helpful thing to keep in mind when you're approaching repair type changes in the stomach and in the distal esophagus. And what she was talking about is when you have in this presentation, I will talk about breast pathology in the area of genomics. Uh, molecular testing has been increasingly used in breast cancer diagnosis and treatment. In this presentation, I will use some case examples to illustrate how we use molecular testing to help us with tumor classification, diagnosis, and treatment. Um, you know, as a surgical pathologist, we don't have to personally do molecular testing, but it's important to know uh, using it as a tool to help us interpreting difficult cases. So for tumor classification, uh, we talk about this in our triple negative breast cancer presentation. Certain special histological subtypes of carcinoma, breast carcinomas, have characteristic somatic uh, genomic alterations. Uh, in difficult cases, we could use these uh, alterations to help us to confirm the diagnosis. For example, I know cystic carcinoma uh, has maybe an FIB uh, rearrangement or maybe L1 rearrangement, maybe amplification. Um, I don't always do this testing. If histologically is consistent, I'll go ahead and make the diagnosis. But in difficult cases, we can do uh, in situ hybridization, sequencing analysis, or recently been using immunochemistry as a surrogate uh, to detect the uh, genomic alteration. Another tumor uh, is this one, secretory carcinoma, has characteristic ETV6 and track fusion, Again, we can use FISH or sequencing analysis or immunoscamtry for pan track to confirm the diagnosis if uh, histologically is not classic, is not uh, definitive. Uh, this is another tumor with unique mutation profile. We talk about tau cell carcinoma with reverse polarity, has unique IDH2 R172 hotspot mutation. This can be detected by uh, sequencing analysis or immunoschemistry using mutation specific immunoschemistry assay. So I don't want to repeat too much. I'll move on to uh, case uh, examples. Uh, to show how we use mole molecular testing uh, helping us in uh, diagnosis in difficult cases. So this case, a uh, patient was a 40-year-old woman with a rapidly growing mass in the breast, almost five centimeters at presentation. Patient had a core biopsy diagnosis, proceeded with mastectomy. I'll show you some images from her mastectomy specimen. This is the...